Good morning and welcome to Lighthouse Baptist Church. We have a lot going on this morning and so we got uh, several people in different areas. We have uh, our children's church is having their Easter celebration over there so we probably have some families or some uh, parents there and then uh, we got a, um, our nursery going to be in here in just a moment so please don't uh, pick up the eggs that you see uh, that's laying around. Uh, if you did have already and eaten the candy that's inside of it, if you'll just put a $20 bill uh, inside the egg and put it back on the floor, uh, we certainly appreciate that. Uh, but, man, we had a wonderful evening uh, yesterday, a, a very uh, workful day yesterday, and I want to thank all of those who came out yesterday and helped with that. Man, we had, uh, there was a whole lot of hard work that went into that, and we appreciate it, each and every one of you that came out and helped. And uh, we just praise God for our outdoor bonanza uh, last night and God working in lives uh, just uh, to celebrate in that. We did, uh, with the cars that were turned in, we did have three uh, that notated that they made a decision for Christ and a couple others that um, notated that they wanted more information on being a disciple of Christ. And so we're uh, very excited about that and praise God for it. And God is so good, uh, you know, we do, uh, we do a lot of work that goes into that, but God does the great work uh, in the hearts and lives. That, that's the work that we can't do, uh, but God, uh, God can. And I have to confess, uh, I was 
Boy, when you get worked that hard and, and everything, sometimes you get uh, a little discouraged, but, um, but God knows exactly what he's doing. And, uh, and so we're excited about those three, and we're going to follow up on them and, and help them in their new walk uh, with Christ. And so you'll be praying, uh, praying for that. Let, matter of fact, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you so much. God, we thank you for being God. Um, you do what we cannot do, Lord. All you've called us to do is to go and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, Christ came to this earth and died on a cross for our sin to take upon himself the wrath of God in our place and to uh, not stay in the grave but rise again, and sitting at the right hand of the Father today, making intercession for us, and we give you glory and praise for that. Father, we thank you for the opportunity last night to serve you, to share the gospel with many, uh, many people, and uh, Father, many that uh, may never come through the doors of this church on a Sunday morning, but God, we had the opportunity last night to share the gospel, and we just pray that you would uh, cause the increase, Lord, and uh, Father, that you would draw them uh, to you and that you would save them, Lord. Father, we thank you for uh, all, the, uh, all those who served you faithfully. Uh, we just pray that you bless them for uh, their faithfulness, God. Pray, praise you for those that are serving today, those in our children's church and our nursery. Father, we just pray that you would bless them and uh, in the time that they're having today and celebrating um, this great story of Easter, that God, that you would use them in a great way, and uh, Father, that you would uh, speak through them uh, to the hearts of our children and to the parents, and God, that you will be glorified through them. We just pray over our service in here this morning. We just pray, Father, that you would work in hearts and lives, those that may have never had a relationship with you, that God, that you would speak to their hearts this morning to know, help them to understand uh, that their need for a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, Father, for those of us that are saved that may be discouraged in any way, Father, that you would encourage us and equip us to go out and to serve you and to be faithful to you, Lord. And Father, we just um, give this over in your hands, knowing God that you're the one that does the work. And we praise you and thank you for that, God. We want this service to bring, bring glory and honor to you this morning. So, Father, we just pray that your will be done. And we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
children in the nursery back there today. Amen. Good to see you today. Let's stand this morning. We're glad you're here today at Lighthouse Baptist Church. Good to see you. Uh, any leftover eggs, they're all yours. Uh, if you could find them. So. Good to see you this morning. Let's sing and praise the Lord a little bit.
give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Amen. Good to see you. Good to see you. If you're a guest or a visitor with us, we're glad you're here. Uh, let's fellowship, shake hands, greet each other. We'll come back and sing a little bit more. Good to see you this morning. Good to see you. Find your way back to your seat. If you can, remain standing. Let's worship a little bit more this morning. Good to see you today.
still all my song. Father, we love you, and Jesus, we pray that you would draw us nearer and nearer to you till that day that we take our flight and we open our eyes to see you face to face. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. We love you, Lord praise and glory this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And I'm excited this morning to have uh, Brother Jack Hoffman uh, with us. He came up um, to do our outdoor bonanza yesterday to speak at that, and I asked him to, uh, if he would to stay over uh, this morning to uh, share uh, God's message with us today as well. He's become a, a friend of ours uh, here at Lighthouse Baptist Church, and uh, we praise the Lord uh, for uh, for him. Matter of fact, I, Jack, I believe if you'd be willing to give uh, give up that Illinois uh, home up there and move down here, they may uh, take you on as pastor here. I, I'm not for sure. Um, we could trade trade slots. You can come down here and shoot these North Carolina deer, and I go to Illinois and and uh, hunt those. But uh, we're excited to uh, have have Brother Jack with us uh, this morning and. Uh, it's been a, a little over a year ago, I guess, that we got introduced together by uh, Brother Billy Casual from Benson Grove, and and uh, I praise the Lord uh, for that, for uh, this uh, friendship that we have and that God has brought together. Uh, we got to, my wife and I got to uh, go up back in November and uh, to Illinois and spend some time with him and and Jill, and and man, we had a, just a wonderful time in their sweet home. And I uh, praise the Lord uh, uh, for them. They are uh, humble servants of God, and, and we praise the Lord for that. And you be praying for Brother Jack as he is uh, taking on a new ministry now. He's no longer pastoring, but uh, he's uh, doing some traveling and, and doing some revival services and, and different things. And so uh, be praying for him as he, uh, as he does that, and that God would use him greatly all over uh, this country, and so we uh, we praise the Lord that He's able to be with us this morning. Pray for them. They got to uh, go back this week. He had a dear friend to to uh, pass away uh, just before uh, coming up, and so he's got to go back and do that funeral, and then turn right around and come back uh, to uh, North Carolina to uh, preach at uh, Brother Billy's church uh, next uh, next week, a week after next, and um, and so be praying for them as they uh, they're traveling. So, Brother Jack, you come. And share God's message with us this morning. My sound man back there. Thank you yesterday for the help at the sportsmen's and women's and kids meeting. That was a lot of fun. All right, so I, my wife, I, my name is Jack. I was born on April 1st. Yesterday is my birthday. Don't sing. But I tell people that's what's made me what I am today, April 1st. My wife is with me. I'm Jack. She's Jill. Just adds to it. Now, how many of you were not here last year when I spoke? Not here. Oh, got some new folks today. Hang on, Okay. You get the good man after I'm gone, but you got to put up with me today, okay? It's good to have you with you. I, I'm so pleased to be here. Pastor and his wife, Dina, I just thank you so much for your hospitality. Um, never dreamed a year ago that we'd become such good friends. You got a good man of God here. You got a good church. I call this the church of the manly handshake. I tell that everywhere I go. I found two of the we 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 just started doing this traveling ministry last year, 
One church we went to in Maine, it was the small church, and it was uh, these people sang like you did today, sang, oh my goodness, our hearts were lifted, and I said, you know, this is, I told him, I said, I told him about the church of the manly handshake, and I said, you know, I said, I'm going to nub you the, the singing happy church, happy singing church, and uh, so, but I can't get away from this, you got the manly handshakes, sorry ladies, you the lately handshakes too, but the man, I'll tell you, they just grip it. So it's a good to be with you today, and I hope the Lord did so, and will continue. All we can do is plant seeds and do our best to give the gospel. And uh, I saw how hard all of the workers here did this weekend, and the pastor and his wife, and you ought to be commended for that. And God will honor it, and God will use it in a mighty way in our church. I want you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 30. I, I've got something to share with you that I think, since I was here last year, uh, I wanted to share this with you, but it wasn't the right time till now. Um, and so I'm talking now to a congregation of people that are of all different ages and different bends in the road. Our road is bent now this year a different way, and I, I love it. I'll do it as long as God allows my wife and I to do this, as long as he gives us opportunity. I'm going to get a chance, a great opportunity. My wife is looking forward to it. We got invited down to the hood in... in uh, uh, St. Louis, and I'm not joking about that. She said the pastor had his car robbed at gunpoint last year uh, with a 13 year old with a gun in his face, and, and he's right down in there. He invited me, I don't know him, I, I'd never met him. He invited me to come down to a revival meeting and do that this fall. So my wife said, Jack, whatever you do, take the old beat up pickup truck down there. <laughs> <laughs> so we're looking forward to going there this fall. I'll go where God calls us to go, you know. Those people on the mission field, right? I mean, they are in. I have a gospel singer told me, he said, I live down there. He said, that's in the hood. I told you it was. Um, but we're, we're enjoying doing this and doing what God wants us to do. But I imagine, with a crowd like this, and I won't ask you to raise your hands, but I imagine some of you are at different times of your life or have been or at there right now where it looks like it's everything's going to end. It looks like it's just, it's, it may be bankruptcy. It may be the death of someone you love. It may be a bad diagnosis from a doctor. I mean, there's a thousand things. And you've just come to the end where you're going, man, I just don't know if I can go on another day. I'm going to share with you some hope this morning. And I hope that, it, again, that it will encourage you when you leave here to keep on keeping on for Christ. I'm going to talk to you about how to get back up when you come to the worst day of your life. Now, some of you think, I oh, ain't going to happen to me. And tomorrow, it may be there. Or maybe this afternoon before you ever get out of here. So let's pray first. Father, I thank you for being able to be here. Get me out of the way. May your word do its work. May the Holy Spirit of God do his work. And Lord, may we be drawn to you in a way that is a blessing today. May we have ears to hear. And Lord, help us hear, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My text is found in 1 Samuel chapter 30. Verses 1 through 9. And it came to pass, when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, and smitten Ziklag, and burned it with fire. And had taken the women captives that were in it, they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people who were with him, the 600 men who were fearless warriors, the 600 men who were with him, lifted up their voice and wept till they had no more power to weep. And then it talks about David's wives being taken. Verse 6, and David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David encouraged himself, and the Lord is God. And David said to Abathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee bring me hither the ephod. And uh, Abathar brought there the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? He answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them. And without fail you will recover all. And so David went and his 600 men, and then the rest of the chapter talks about how he went back 
and got those men, and then what happened after that, we'll talk about it briefly. The date was October the 31st, 1993. Some of you can't remember that far back. I wanted to preach on politics and the Christian's responsibility. But during my study that week, God had troubled me about what I learned about this passage and the truths and the following principles he gave to me, and I thought I had to teach them to our church rather than what I wanted to preach. Our youngest son, Matthew, 13, was home sick with cold and bronchial problems. So I started my presentation in my church from a beautiful song written by Bill and Gloria Gaither. I mean, I'm giving you my history. This really happened. When you've knelt beside, and my wife's history, when you've knelt beside the rubble of an aching, broken heart, when the things you've given your life to fall apart, you're not the first to be acquainted with sorrow, grief, or pain, but the master promised sunshine after the rain. Hold on, my child. Joy comes in the morning. Weeping only endures or lasts for the night. Hold on, my child. Joy comes in the morning. The darkest hour means dawn is just a sight. And then I said this to the people in our church. If you came to the most difficult experience of your life and your whole world crashed down around you and it was lying in a smoldering rubble at your feet, like I'm going to describe to you a minute about David. If it looked as though this was the end and there was no hope for the future, could you pick yourself back up? Could you survive? Could you even thrive? So then I preached that sermon and the truths that God had burnt on my heart to our church. We took our 13 and a year old, half a year old uh, Matthew to the doctor on Tuesday, a boy who, by the way, was never sick in his life. He was given some medication. We were told he'd be out of school for a few days. He woke us up on Wednesday morning at 5 a.m., feverish and hallucinating. And the hospital at that time, they had no buildings there, was just across the field from the parsonage. We rushed him into the emergency room. The doctor was called. The nurses frantically tried to save him. But he went into the presence of Jesus Christ by 6.30 a.m. And my whole world lay smoldering rubble. I never really got to know what true sorrow or debilitating grief was until Matthew died. Neither did my wife. He was our baby. I never knew the pain of loss could run so deep. And the days that followed us, those of you who may remember those experiences, if you went through them, waves of sorrow and weeping would sweep over me unexpectedly, leaving me drained, emotionally fatigued, and at times weary of life. I have to tell you that in the weeks and the months that followed, even the years that followed, the principles I'm going to share with you today that God gave to me a couple days before Matthew left us, and I didn't know I was going to need them, were the things that buoyed my soul. They picked me up over and over and over again. They became my life preservers. They helped me stay the course. Time and time again, I rehearsed these truths, brought them back to my mind, thought about them, and practiced them. I had no way of knowing that this sermon God had laid on my heart and the truths he taught me just days before our very healthy boy left for heaven was perhaps more for the benefit of me than anyone else in our church, and I hope today for you. It's one thing in your mind's eye to think about David and the situation he was in. It's another thing for you to be kneeling in the ash and devastation of all your hopes and dreams feeling the sting of hot ashes as they bite against your skin, wondering if there's going to be a tomorrow. Now, I don't care what life-altering circumstance you have been or may be into to bring you to a place of brokenness. It may be your own sin. It may be your own mistakes. It may be your own choices. Or it may be bankruptcy or what I said, rejection maybe, or even like we did and we experienced the loss of a loved one. You know what? Many times, people never recover. They become immobilized, they're frozen in time, crippled from their experience, and they're unable to go on, and everything dates back to that event. Am I right? Sure. Remember the story. David is living in exile from King Saul. And he's been living in the land of Israel's archenemy, Philistia, 
for the last 16 months in a small village called Ziklag. The only one who trusted him was a king named Achish. Well, they got a they got realized they were, the Philistines were going to fight Israel. So when King Achish was going to join with the other Philistine leaders, David and his group of men that had followed him risked all everything to everything to follow him. They had to travel about 50 miles away at a place called Aphek. And there he was providentially hindered from fighting against his own people. If you remember the story, the king liked him, he believed in him, but the rest of the princes of, of the Philistines said, we can't go with him, he's going to turn around and he'll cut us and sh sh you know, stab us in the back in the middle of this war. So King Achan said, even though I trust you, David, you've got to go back home where you're living, where I'm letting you live. And so they'd turn around and go back. In the meantime, while they were gone, these other marauding enemy came in and they just swept over that little town which sits on a hill and they took all of their families and all the possessions they wanted. Didn't kill anybody. They just There was nobody there to kill. All the strong men had left and they just took them all and took off with them. And so as they come back now, having been away and they're walking across the desert, I know what happened. I can visualize this. They're walking, you know, they're tired, they're wondering, and David's wondering, why in the world we're why did we just make that trip and got to come back? And then some, one of the guys looks up, there's 600 men, and he goes, hey, is that smoke I see up there? And all of a sudden they start realizing that that's smoke in the sky, and you know what happened. They just whew, took off running. And they go running into what used to be their town, and it's not a town anymore. Well, I've been up here. We had tornadoes back home. I saw a picture of one of the towns not too many miles from where I live, and it don't look like a town anymore. It's devastated. Well, that place was devastated. Everything's torn down, and it's in rubble. Smoke is just coming up, still smoldering, still hot embers. And pe these men are running around trying to find their wives and their kids, and they're all just collapsing, and they're tired, and they're falling down, and David had fallen down too because he's lost everything. And he's down there, and he's crying. And ladies and gentlemen, it's one thing when a woman cries. That touches my heart. But when you get 600 men who are fearless warriors... They're not afraid to cut your head off. And they start crying. They are brokenhearted. They have lost their families. These guys had left everything to follow this man. Everything. They're no longer uh, wanted in Israel. They know they've got a bounty on their heads. They had risked it all. They're fearless men, and then they realize they've lost it all. And David's lost it all. And he's there, and he's, they're weeping. And he's all around him. These guys are just... <laughs> and they're weeping and then one of them says it's all his fault you get me we left everything to follow him it's all his fault I imagine I can just see him getting up and kind of growling around each other it's David's fault you know what we ought to do we ought to take some stones and what we ought to kill him we have gave everything and they're all gone and David is there now Ladies and gentlemen, put yourself in this position. Maybe you've been there. Everybody around you is going, it's all your fault. And the devil's saying to you, it's all your fault. If you hadn't moved here, that never happened. If you hadn't made that choice, that never happened. And you're just so oh, broken. And he hears these guys, the guys that sworn, sworn their life to him, we ought to kill him. And something took place in David's heart. He is broken. He's like them. He's lost it all. It's like the end of everything. And somewhere down in, the, in his heart, something took place. And the Bible, see, we skip over this stuff so quick. But David encouraged himself. The Lord is God. And something took place in him where he started going, I, I got to get back up. I, I got to get back. I got to go on. I got to go on. There's a reason to go on. Something took place so dramatically in his life that those 600 men, suddenly the switch got turned. And they said, oh, we're not going to kill him. We're going to follow him again. What was it? How did he, the, the word in the King James is encouraged. But it, it means strengthened, if you've got a new American or other translation. It means strengthened. What that happened in his life that caused him to strengthen himself? How did he go from discouraged and broken and at the end of the road and like there is no reason to even think about another day to where he's getting back up. He says, gentlemen, let's go get our families. And they go, okay, let's go get them. Man, I'm, I, 
I wish I could have been there, Brother Tim. What a, you talk about general? Well, what happened? Well, I started thinking about it, and when I prepared this sermon, I realized there was at least four things that David internal, internalized in his life. I'll give them to you very briefly, and maybe one of these will help you like they helped me. Number one, these are truisms. If you've taken notes, number one, he realized this reality, and that's the reality of promise. Promise. Before in his life, David was a shepherd boy. And God moved on a prophet and said, I I got somebody I want you to anoint for king. It goes like this. Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I rejected him from being king of Israel? Fill your horn with oil. Go, I'm sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. I've selected a king for myself among his sons. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with beautiful eyes, remember he was the youngest, the, the, didn't look like any of the warrior boys. He had a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. 1 Samuel 16, verses 1, verse 12 and 13. God is immutable. He does not change. He's not like a man that may not be able to keep his word. God had said, David, you will be king. Everyone knew it. Samuel the prophet knew it. The men that followed David knew it. The whole nation of Israel knew it. And most importantly, King Saul and his son Jonathan knew it because King Saul said to him one time in 1 Samuel 24, And now, behold, I know well that thou shalt surely be king. And that the kingdom of Israel be established in your hand. In fact, he made David promise to him, please, when you become king, don't kill my family. That was the reality. A deep, abiding conviction in his heart. You will be king. And when he's down there on his knees, in the worst day of his life, he realizes, guess what? I'm not king yet. God gave me a promise. I haven't seen that promise fulfilled yet. God gave me a promise. This is the reality that kept Joseph from losing his heart in a prison cell in Egypt. Because he knew one day, God had said, I will exalt you over your brothers, even your father. That was a reality that according to Acts chapter 12, that kept Peter, he was so confident when he got thrown in jail. None of you understand this, we don't. You know, James got his head cut off by the same people long before that. And they got a hold of Peter, and they threw him in jail. And when you read that sometime in Acts chapter 12, the night he gets thrown in jail, what is he doing? He goes to sleep. Now, I don't know about you, but if I know the people that cut off the head of one of the most important men in Jerusalem had thrown me in jail and said, probably tomorrow yours is going to get lopped off again, I don't think I'd be sleeping very good. But the Bible says, you can read it, he laid down and went to sleep. He was so tired and so asleep that when the angels came to deliver him, they had to kick him to wake him up. Get up. Get up. Your deliverance is here. Get up. Oh, okay. So what? Was he dull? No. You know why he was able to do that? Because he remembered when he got put in that jail that Jesus had said to him before he left uh, heaven, he said, Peter... When you're young, you're going to do such and such. But when you become old, when you grow old, that's when you're going to die. I I can show you the scripture. And he laid down and he realized, I'm not old yet. (laughs) Good night, guys. They thought he's crazy. No, he just had a promise. It's the blessed reality that if you're today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, if you don't know where you're going this morning, he says, come unto me, all you that labor, labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. You can't get rest in anything else but Jesus Christ. You can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Bible says you shall be saved. It's the same promise. That have, many of you have taken that promise. Or you've accepted, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I am saved today based on the promises of Jesus Christ for me. And you take those promises. That's the reality of a promise. You take that, and with the same intensity of a drowning man would latch onto a a piece of driftwood, 
when Matthew died, a man came by our house. People came by all day. Some preacher, I don't know who he was to this day, was visiting a pastor friend of mine. He walked in, he shook my hand, and he said, I'm, and he just quoted one scripture to me. I mean, he showed compassion. He wasn't trying to preach. He said, Isaiah 26, 9, thy dead shall live. Whew. Thy dead shall live. My dead body shall rise. Awaken, seeing ye that dwell in the dust. I was in Sunday school as a child, and these promises came back to me. You know the promise where Jesus in John chapter 11 said, I am the resurrection and the life? He that, do you remember that? I learned it. Pardon your ears. I learned it in Sunday school. It went like this. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never, never die. Wow. My boy's not dead. He's going to live forever. Because he loved Jesus Christ. What a promise. How reassuring. 1 Corinthians 15 grew in my sight. You know, there's people who don't think you need these books anymore. Boy, I do. I don't care how you get it. You need to get in the Word of God. Promise after promise after promise. You learn those promises. There's a promise for you. There's many promises for you in there. Cling to them. Embrace them with every fiber of your being. Clutch them. Memorize them. Quote them. Remind God of them. Write them on a thing on, put them on your refrigerator and your dashboard. Wear it on your jewelry or your clothing. Consume it. Fill your mind with its assurances. Sing it out loud. Everybody, it's a promise. David had a promise. Would you say, repeat after me. God has a promise for me. Is that true or not? Okay. I'm not into a lot of crazy stuff you see on TV. I'm just telling you. Isn't that the truth? God has a promise for you, for you personally. The book is full of them. And David picked himself up because he knew he wasn't king yet. Number two, there's the reality of provision. What else happened in David's heart? I think also not only did he realize he hadn't received the promise, but I think he also realized that God was sufficient. Even though it looked like everything was gone and every, there was no reason even to think he could go on another day, he knew he served a God who could provide even when it looked like there was nothing left. On his knees, he remembered how years before he had internalized that conviction before the Philistine giant Goliath. He went to King Saul. He, could not, he couldn't stand this man blaspheming God's people. And Saul said, well, try this. Or, no, I don't wear your armor. I got my own stuff. I got a, I got a slingshot. He's a big, by the way, I, you know, I know you've probably heard this before, but let me, let me tell you, Goliath was ugly. Anybody over nine foot tall is ugly. So anyway, big ugly giant out there. And King Saul's trying to de- mess with him. He says, you can't do nothing about him. And David, little young David, looks up at him. He says, well, I want to tell you something. I used to tend my daddy's sheep, and he said, along came a lion, I killed it. Along came a bear, and I killed it because the Lord delivered me out of the paw of the lion, and the Lord delivered me out of the paw of the bear, and this same God will deliver me from the hand of this big, ugly Philistine. (laughs) That's in the original. All right, so God will provide. Well, did he? Sure he did. He helped him kill a lion, helped him kill a bear, helped him take a sling on kill that giant. Abraham had seen God's provision on Mount Moriah. When he took his boy up there and his boy said, well, we got the fire, we got the wood, but where's the lamb? And Abraham said, God will provide himself. He'll provide a sacrifice for us. Paul understood it when he said in Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all your needs in Christ Jesus. Whatever it is you need in your life right now, no matter what you're facing in your life, God is going to see to it. If you trust him, if you need courage, if you need money, if you need friends, if you love God and you need, need uh, uh, health, you need whatever it is, you know, God will provide for it. I have a son that was so sick, Daniel Moldis boy, when he, when he was a baby, had to have kidney removed and bladder surgery. God provided for us. We didn't have anything to do it. He took care of him all the way through that. And he still is alive today and raising a family. In fact, I got two. Now I have two great-grandchildren. 
Oh, my. I am. St- we got to see the one. We, one got, she couldn't wait till we got back. She had it while we were traveling. So now we got to go back, and all we got is a picture. We got to see those grand, great grandbabies. When we needed to move to Seattle to do church work, God provided on the way for us. When we needed money to rent a place in the Upper Peninsula, when we worked, God provided. When Matt died, we had $17 in the checkbook, 170 bucks in our savings account. We had no insurance for burial, no pre-planning, no grave plots, no reserves, and we, li- we were serving a financially deficient church. They could not and never did help us. But the Holy Spirit, I tell you today, as sure as I'm standing before you, in the hospital waiting room, when the doctor came in and told us that Matthew had died, spoke to my heart just as sure as it would have been audible, and he said, Jack, you won't have to worry about money. I don't know how to explain that to you. I didn't have to. God took care of everything. He'll do the same for you. He'll do the same for you. God sent it in in so many different ways that we ended up having a financial abundance. It, I, would I rather have Matthew? Of course. But God made sure he eased that part of our life as we went through that. If there's one truth I've believed and have realized and experienced time and time again, and even though it's not in verse, it is taught throughout the scripture, so I'm going to give this to you. God will be no man's debtor. If you do right by God, God will be no man's debtor. Now, he may not give it to you the same way. Don't buy them prosperity preachers. But you know what? You will have prosperity because God will always take care of you. And he'll take you to heaven. He'll watch over you. He'll never have anyone stand before him and say, you know, I gave a tithe and I gave an offering and you never took care of me. No way. He always takes care of us. He'll be no man's debtor. So you and I have got to understand that there is this provision from God. So David, down on his knees, remembered the provision of God, and he must have thought to himself, the same God that delivered me from the lion and the bear is the same God who can deliver me now from this situation. He delivered me from Goliath. He can deliver us from this, even though I can't see the end before the beginning. Ladies and gentlemen, God has not changed. He is still the great provider. He did it before. Can I get a Baptist amen? He'll do it again. Amen. Amen? So maybe you'd try this one with me. God will provide for me. I'm not lying. Is that not in the Bible? God, man, get some anchor here, man. I got a promise from God, and God's going to provide for me. Number three is a reality. I call it parentage or personal intimacy with God. David knew. He just didn't know about God. He had a personal relationship with God. He had an intimate relationship with God that transcended God just being the sovereign, who he is, but also God loving him as his father. In his darkest hour, David had to remind himself of the love that his father, God, had showed him time and time again. God was the Lord, his God, his God. He knew God as his loving father. David was the one who would lyrically write, and he'd sing this, As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. He would record that God was the one who daily loads me with with benefits. The Lord is, Psalm 23, all you probably know this, the Lord is what? My shepherd. Personal. I know him as my shepherd. He's my Lord. He's my father. He's my God. It's a reality of parentage or personal intimacy. God is too loving to do anything unkind. Why are you here, David? I don't know, but he's not being unkind to you. He's too wise to ever make a mistake. Well, God, God didn't make a mistake in this. I mean, there's a reason. He's too deep to have to explain himself. He's too tender to ever be insensitive. He's too caring to ever torment us. He travels every road. He walks every step. He hears every sigh. He sees every tear that falls from his child's eye. You know why? Because he cares. I shared a note last night to your men from my father before he died where he told me he loved me. A lot of men never have heard. He told me that letter. My dad never told me that. He said, I want to make sure my sons know I love them. The last thing he did before he died was have my mom put a phone up to his ear from his hospital bed because he couldn't move his arms. And he said, I want to tell you I love you. I know my father loves me here. I know my father loves me from heaven, my heavenly father. But in that capacity as a loving parent, 
God uses the experiences of life to develop in us the character of his son. My daddy used to say when, he, when I'd come home, um, I hate to, I look so astute and so dignified, I hate to admit this, but I wore out a cherry tree in the back of, the back of our yard. My dad, I, my dad would come home and mom would tell him, she, he'd say, Jack, go out and cut off another switch off that tree back there. After a while, I couldn't reach them. I tried to get the littlest ones, you know. And I'd bring it in, and he said, you know, son, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Now, anybody ever have her daddy say that to him? I thought, well, you just let me hit you then. No, no. He never used his hand, by the way. Stung. And, you know, he said, you know why I'm doing that? He said, I want you to behave yourself. I'm not. But those, the, 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 the Perry kids, dads, never, they never do nothing to them. They don't love their kids like I love you. <laughs> You've heard that, haven't you? And you know what? I wish I could see my dad, and I will someday, and say, Dad, you were exactly right, because you love me. And so he disciplined me, and that's what God does. It is said a skilled physician who is about to perform a delicate operation on a patient's ear said reassuringly to the patient, I may hurt you, but I'm not going to injure you. That's what it is. God's going to make us with character to be what we should be. That was a character-building time in David's life. He knew he had a heavenly father, and God brought him there to teach him something he could have gotten nowhere else. I was reading in a devotion this morning, and I read in Isaiah chapter 45. You should read it. It's really cool. 8 through 24, where God says, I'm the fashioner, I'm the maker, you're the clay. How can you say to the maker how I should be built? How could you say to your mother or your father, why did you have me? You weren't involved in the process. They did what they did to create you. I am creating you as God the Father. I rule the nations. I create them. I created all the world. And as a matter of fact, he says in Isaiah, Therefore every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. And then Paul, the great theologian he was, said, You know what about Jesus Christ? He is God. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is God. And he is the one who's got the right to mold us and make us. Uh, I had a dear friend, Jimmy King, die a very young man. I went to see him. He was dying of cancer many, many years ago. And he said to me, Jack, I, and he was a gospel singer. He said, Jack, he said, uh, well, he said, this is hard. He said, but I've learned so much about God in the middle of this, I can't complain. My wife's brother, David Perrin, was dying of cancer, very long, horrible death. He died at 35. I called him one day from Seattle, Washington. He was in Florida in ministry, but he was, he was dying. And I called him one day to see how he was doing. And I said, Dave, how you doing? And and he started talking, and then he just started quoting a poem to me. Just like that. Dying brother-in-law. It goes like this. When God wants to drill a man and thrill a man and skill a man, when God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part, when he yearns with all his heart to build so great and bold a man, then all the world shall be amazed. Then watch his methods and watch his ways. How he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects. How he hammers him and hurts him into shapes and forms of clay, which only God can understand. While man's tortured heart is crying and he lifts beseeching hands, yet God bends but never breaks. When man's good he undertakes. How he uses whom he chooses and with mighty power infuses him. With every act induces him to try his splendor out. God knows what he's about. And that's what God does for all of us. He don't want you to go off in the bushes, in the weeds. So he keeps you on the straight and narrow. But he does it because he loves you. And he's always with us because he's our parent. A.W. Tozer said in, in a book called I Talk Back to the Devil, I believe that God will crucify without pity those whom he desires to raise without measure. So you may be in this thing right now that you're dealing with because God loves you so much he wants to make you a better person. Wow, it's hard to believe, but it works that way. So here's one for you. God, God is my heavenly Father who loves me. Would you say that with me again? God is my heavenly Father who loves me. And every time you get into something that just seems like, I can't, and somebody says, why don't you curse God and die, you old buzzard? You turn and say, God is my heavenly Father. He loves me. I'll give you the fourth one before we go home. I think the fourth thing that really built him up and got him to get back up there and march out there with that army and 
beat the enemy was a reality I call, a truism I call, providence. Providence. God knows. Do you believe that God knows everything? I do. God is all-knowing. In his darkest hour, David had to remind himself that this plight was not by accident. Can I tell you, nothing happens by chance. I mentioned last night, I had to find my father's note after 20-some years in a drawer. It wasn't by chance because I wanted to communicate last night that to these men about what's important in life. You know, something else that happened, thank you for mentioning it. I have a dear friend I've known for 25 years who I found out on Sunday that uh, he, um, I've been ministering to him for years. He was a hunter safety instructor with me. He's 71 years of age. I asked his son about something else. I said, how's your dad? And he told me he was really bad. So Monday I had to go see him over in Terre Haute, about 30 miles from us. And uh, I went in and, and got to see Mick. And Mick, big, big old gruff guy, big guy, you know, and looked like he looks like a, like a bear, you know. And he said, what are you doing here, Jack? And I said, I said, because I love you, Mick, because I love you. And then I got a chance to share with him the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everybody ought to know. Everybody needs to know. And I pray for Mick. And I'll go back now and, and speak to his family. And I love those people. I love them. Um, it's not by chance. We had all those men and women there last night. They need to know God loves them. They need to know how the gospel of Jesus Christ is as simple as believing that you just rest completely on Jesus like I did on a tree strap when, it made, when my stand broke and I was hanging on the side of a tree. That's what salvation is. I believe in Jesus Christ and nothing else. And Jesus is the one who saves my life. And when you come to him that way, all the other stuff is peripheral. He is the, he is the God of providence. He went to God in prayer, and we read it, and God said to him, you will recover them all, providentially. He was wondering why. Why am I over here when I didn't, wasn't able to go fight that battle? So he goes with his men, and he recovers his family. Two of the men had to stay by a river because they were so wore out. And he and his 400 men get his wives and their children, all that back. He turns around, they come back to Ziglag. This thing took like three days. In the meantime, when he's over here, this away, where he can't know, you know, they got no modern communication. There ain't no text messages. When he's over here, way back over here, way back over here, King Saul and his sons are involved in that battle that he was kept out of. And guess what happens? King Saul and his sons get what? You know the story. Killed. They get killed. So Dave and his men don't know this is going on. He don't know why he's over here. He gets his family, and they come back to that burnout city thinking, man, we're going to have to, can you imagine rebuilding a whole town that's burnt up? What are we going to do? We're here at the, at the friendship of the Philistines. What are we going to do? And they come back to that town, and about the time they get to that town, here's this guy running across the prairie. <laughs> and he gets up to him, and they say, what do you want? He says, David, you're king. You may be only one day away from receiving the victory that God has for you. You may be only hours away from God releasing you from that problem, but you can't give up. God is a God of providence. He knows why he put you over there, because over there he was changing the whole, the whole scenery of the politics. And when David came back, they didn't live in Ziklag. They took back to Jerusalem. And you know where you're at right now? You're not going to stay there because God providentially is taking you someplace you had no idea of if you're letting. So is providence. Who knows? Like David, you may be just one day from receiving all that God has for you. Stay steadfast. Joseph said to his brothers, as for you, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result. I have a friend, this is how it works, and I could give you, every one of you can give me examples. I have a friend named Dave Samuel, he's just a nice guy, and he, he's a, been a conservation editor for Bowhunter for years, he's, and he came and hunted with us several times, he did seminars in our church, he's a Christian, <clears throat> but years ago, he had a surgeon mess up a surgery, botched it up in a clinic, and it, it, it damaged his diaphragm, he's been in our house before. And he has to use a CPAC and other stuff at night. 
He can't fly on planes, I think, at heights. The rest of his life, he was damaged because of that diaphragm being messed up. And he thought that was terrible. Changed the way he lived, changed what he had to do, where he could go hunting in the mountains, stuff like that. And he endured that for, and has endured it for years. Um, like 15 years or so later, COVID came along. I'm th and I saw one day on the post that uh, about 2020, something like that, he put a post on these, and he talked about getting COVID. Now, here's a man that, now he's like 80 or 81. Here's a man that, I mean, if this guy is going to succumb to COVID, and I've lost friends, just like you have, it would have been him. And then I called him. I said, how are you doing? He said, I'm doing all right. Now, that was back when they weren't giving anybody therapeutics or anything. You just say, I'll put you on a machine, and I don't want to go there. Anyway, so I called him. I said, how are you doing? He said, I'm doing pretty good. He said, let me tell you what happened. He said, I called up the University of uh, West Virginia or wherever it was, the hospital, and they were interviewing me, and I, and I have COVID, and they, and they were, okay, mm-hmm. And then the doctor said something to him. He said, okay, do you have any other extenuating circumstances? Well, yeah, I have an injured diaphragm. It was clipped, and he said that phone went dead on the other side. <coughs> and he said about 15 seconds, and finally the doctor said, how quick can you get in here? Well, I can come right away. Okay. He went in the hospital, and they gave him everything that they wouldn't give him. Uh, now, listen to me. Everything they wouldn't give him because he had hurt that diaphragm over a decade earlier. The thing that he thought was going to hinder his life was the thing that ultimately saved his life. That's what's happened to a lot of us in a lot of different areas. The thing that you thought was horrible was the thing that God said, I'll take you through it. I'll never leave you, and I'll be with you. God knows what's best for our life. I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn to humbly obey. I asked for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I'd be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I got nothing I asked for, but everything I hope for, I am among all men most richly blessed. That's the way God works in our life in providence. So David, down there on his knees, picked himself back up. And he thought to himself, you know what? My father, God, is watching over me. God is watching over me. Believe that? Providential. The reality of promise, provision, parentage, and providence. I'm here to tell you today, no matter what you deal with in life, and if you think it's the end, like David, get back up. God will answer his, his children. Don't give up. Don't give up. Grab a promise. Don't give up. Realize God will provide even though you don't see it right now. Don't give up. Don't forget that God loves you as your heavenly father. Don't give up. God Almighty is a God of providence. He brought you here for a particular purpose in your life. And he's going to develop in you the character of Jesus and of a child of God. Don't stay in the ashes of discouragement. Wherever you're at this morning, you could be one day from victory, one day from blessings. Don't listen to the whispering of that old lying spirit that says it's all over. Stay in those ashes. Don't get back up. Pick yourself back up with those principles and say, I am going to serve God until God takes me home. Don't give up. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me, please? Number one, if you're not saved, I'm telling you right now, if you're not saved, if you don't know that you know you're going to heaven, I'm going to ask you right now just to slip your hand up and say, would you pray for me? i really like to know what that knowing Jesus is all about. I want you to slip your hand up and say, would you pray for me? I'm not going to come to you, but it doesn't hurt for you to come forward and deal with it and have somebody pray with you. I've seen prisoners in Mexico stand up and walk across courtyards in front of violent criminals who knew they had to live what they lived when they went back to the cell blocks to come to Jesus Christ. So if you don't know him and you want somebody to help pray with you, come on down. Or maybe you're a Christian here and you realize this morning, God sent you here for this message. 
and you say, Pastor Jack, Brother Jack, I am not going to give up. You helped, it helped me this morning to know I have a promise that God will provide, that he's my father, that it's not a mistake where I'm at. And you'll just say, slip your hand up and say, would you pray for me? I'm in a difficult time, like you were, in many different ways. But just pray for me. I'll remember you when I go home. Anybody like to thank you? Anybody else? Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. I won't forget you. I'll pray for you because you're going to make it. Anybody else? God bless you. Anybody else? I'm right there. I'm right there where I could just stay here in the ashes. But it's time for me to get back up because I've got a promise. I've got to find those promises. I've got, I've got a father who cares about me, who will provide for me. Anybody else? I'm going to make that decision in my heart. I'm going to get back up. Don't give up. Don't become someone they say, I don't know where so-and-so went. Now, Lord, as we extend an invitation, as pastor extends an invitation also, I pray if there's folks here that need to come and just take care of submitting that right now, making that decision right now between you and them, I pray you'd help them do that. And I'll thank you for it. Maybe someone who today who's going to come say, I really need to make sure that I know that I'm Jesus, I, I'm Jesus Christ's son or daughter. I'm going to make sure I know that I'm a child of God. I pray you'd help them as we get to this invitation in Jesus' name. Will you stand with me? And if God moves in your heart to come and pray about anything in that way, you come on down, all right? Another person invitation because 
I really believe, I really believe that we shouldn't, we shouldn't push God out of the way. Maybe if somebody wants to do business with the Lord, maybe you haven't been baptized. You want to come and say, I need to follow Christ. I need to just follow him. I don't know whatever it is, but you know, that song you're singing, the original version, I believe if I remember right, was played on the Titanic when it was sinking. A sinking ship, but they knew they were nearer to God. God will, God will meet your needs today if you just come. So let's do one more verse of that. And if you want to come and pray, just come on down. There let the way appear Steps unto Him All that Thou sendest me In mercy spend time praying. Brother Pastor Tim, thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to be with you. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Jack. We appreciate you and Jill uh, making your way here this weekend. We praise the Lord for you. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer for them, if you would pray for them, that God would continue to use them uh, greatly in his word. Father, we love you so much. We're thankful, God, that you are uh, a God of promise. Uh, you're a God who provides. You're a God uh, who uh, just gives us everything, Lord. You're uh, a parent who loves us so dearly. And you have a plan for our lives that, Lord, we may not understand uh, what you're doing. We may not we may not even like the circumstances that we have to go through, the valleys that we walk through to get to the other side, to get to that place in which you desire for our lives, God. But, Lord, we can trust in you. And I'm thankful for that, Lord. And I pray over uh, everyone here this morning, Lord, if there's anyone who has never put that trust and faith in you, God, I pray that this morning that, Lord, that they'll just call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll They'll give their life to you, Lord. They'll surrender you to your lordship. And, Father, that you would come into their heart and change their life for all eternity. Father, we prayed for Brother Jack and his wife Jill as they travel. We pray that you would keep your hedge around them. And Father, we pray that you would just uh, empower them as they go from place to place to be an encouragement to people, Lord to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And most of all, Lord, that they will bring glory and honor and praise to your name and to your kingdom. And we thank you for that. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you run out of here uh, this morning, don't forget, ladies, that um, I know we're just getting done with Outdoor Bonanza, but ladies have uh, an event coming up on May the 20th. And, uh, and so please, um, if you plan on, to, on attending this, please see my wife, Dina, or uh, you can see Danny, uh, Danielle. And so I can't say Danny because they all go to uh, Danny Wood, and Danny Wood be like, what, what, what are you talking about? But, uh, uh, but go see Danielle and uh, sign up for this, and, and I'm telling you, you're going to have a great, great time. Eric and, and Lori Allis will be here. Laura's going to do... Uh, uh, do the women's event and then uh, their family will be here on that Sunday morning and so uh, we're looking forward to a great weekend that weekend as well but sign up for that God bless you guys have a wonderful uh, weekend